So I think some of you have heard kind of how we've come about, but just to, to provide a little extra background. Um, I'm not sure we've exactly left grading jail, but we're at least at grading probation. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Yes. We're we're getting we're, better. We're on house arrest now. Yes, Maybe. yeah. <laughs> Touch and go. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And very much at infant stages. We think we have successfully started Think Space, but have a ways ways to go. Um, so far, so good in terms of ease of use and implementing. Um, we're just learning a lot because now we're gathering more data in terms of what students know and what they don't know. So we feel like we've got a ways to go, but we kind of have a good start. Um, so. Okay, so just a little bit about uh, FSHN 411, it's ingredient functionality. So ingredient interactions and formulations, uh, which start out with our complex systems and where we're trying to get students to critically think through if you change an ingredient in a system, what happens? And they can't just think about that ingredient, they have to think about everything else in the process and the other ingredients that are there. Um, we could get them to do part of that, we just couldn't get them to get quite the whole way very easily. Uh, two credits, so one lecture, one lab in the week. Um, it used to be three credits, so you had more play, um, but the way that curriculum is set is very tight um, between the dietetics and the food science, culinary food science majors, and I don't know exactly. At some point in time, it got reduced before we um, started teaching. So um, kind of a tight spot trying to cover whole ingredient category in a lecture and then seeing those differences in a lab setting um, is the way that it's set up currently. So we had a number of challenges, and Joey and I, is this the fourth time we've taught it? Third. Third, third time? Together, and yeah. one time separately before. Um, so each time we've tried to look at what's working, what's not working, um, trying to streamline. So we cut some things that we just did not think were working to try to get us a little more space. Um, some of our challenges, the two credits, when really we're probably trying to shove three credits worth of material into those two credits. Uh, we have a different set of prerequisites, majors, and uh, future careers that are all mixed together. So we have food science, culinary food science, and dietetics all in this course. Um, they come from two different uh, prereqs that are taught differently enough that we have a varying set of gaps coming in. So uh, the dietetic students and the culinary food science students take 214 and 215, which is scientific study of food, but it's very application-based. And then we have the food science students coming in with food chemistry, which is very much the chemistry, but maybe not a lot of the applications. Um, and they're taught just enough differently uh, that some students come in with a lot of knowledge on one topic, but not very much on the next. But other sets of students come in with a lot of knowledge one, but a different gap. Um, and so we're trying to get everybody caught up because we're trying to get them to not only understand what's happening with the food, but when you change ingredients and then be able to think that through and apply it in future situations. So we're kind of coming in all different spots, but trying to get them further than what really we have time to do. Um, and that was getting us some problems with grading because we were trying to basically drag them along to get them where we needed them to be, but they weren't. And so then spending time on grading lab reports was somewhat painful. I think. Yeah. Very painful. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Cause one of the things, and I'll, I'll just sort of piggyback yeah, here a little yeah. bit. Um, one of the things that we really wanted to do was to get our students to think critically. How we want to do some problem solving, some creative thinking, um, and and the way we had it structured was they would basically do a lab report after their lab and 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 maybe try to talk more about in the discussion part what was happening and, and that kind of thing. Uh, two problems with that. One, well, at least two problems. <laughs> yeah. um, one, we were seeing that it it wasn't occurring the way we wanted it to occur. We thought, okay, we'll give them these questions. They're going to think about them, and they're going to come back and with all these great thoughts and how to approach problems and all that kind of thing. We just did this in lab, you know, and, and they can surely apply this now. That, that, that didn't happen. And so we were seeing some um, lab reports were just frustrating us. Um, and it was obviously on our end because mm -hmm. it was across the board. Um, and the other thing was, and we're going to probably going to get a little bit more into that, is um, we couldn't give them feedback right away because we have 60 students in the course. We're talking about multi-page lab reports, um, and we have other assignments in there as well. And it was just we were we were drowning. We were absolutely mm -hmm. drowning in lab reports, and we weren't getting any sort of feedback to them 
in what we thought was an appropriate amount of time. Students, I think, were a little bit more generous towards us than maybe yeah. we were ourselves, <laughs> but yeah. Uh, turned in. Um, via Blackboard. Yeah. Yep. So we, we graded via Blackboard, um, which presents its own set of challenges. Uh, they submitted by that, and they could look at their, um, their graded reports through that. Uh, so that's where we kind of started from. Mm -hmm. Actually, you could go faster on paper than you could on Blackboard, but we wanted to be able to capture uh, sure. the lab reports, especially for some of the IFT certification and all that stuff of the program. You're supposed to have a certain amount of them and all that stuff. So um, Blackboard was better for that in terms of holding on to reports, but not necessarily grading faster. We were trying to do rubrics, and it was just ugly because you couldn't give enough comments fast enough. Um, and we know that the faster you get comments, the better off students are in terms of what they're learning. So we were sitting on that piece uh, of the puzzle as well. Um, so we started um, really just not knowing where to start, I think, with the program. Um, so two things. When Holly came in for the accessibility short course um, through uh, the Brenton Center, uh, and showed, that was the first time I saw Think Space. Um, and it was the full case trying to figure out what was wrong and the di diagnostic steps I went. Um, and so that was, yeah, that was a very much a light bulb turning on going, okay, there's something we can use because we've got to take these problems in smaller steps to get students where we need them to go. Um, and so that was kind of my first idea. Um, we kind of morphed into cookie simulations because I wanted a system that you could really break down and understand what was happening at each step. Um, Learned probably that a bit off more than I could chew and that cookies are hard to make digital, right? So we, we had some learnings over the summer. Um, but from that and getting experience with ThinkSpace and then um, sitting down with Joey, I was probably in July sometime. I think it was right around the time that we had the ThinkSpace um, workshop going, okay, this is what ThinkSpace can do. This is what I've started doing. What do we really need it to do? Which um, in some ways you think maybe we should have gotten there sooner, but it just took a while to figure out what the capabilities were, uh, what we were trying to do, and then really nitty gritty, like how do we do this? Um, and so we morphed a little bit. We used the cookie simulation as an introduction into ThinkSpace and thinking through complex systems um, and experimental design. So it fit very well as, as a longer simulation to do one of the weeks for our lab to make sure that ThinkSpace worked for everybody and that they really got used to it when we were there because um, the rest of the ThinkSpace stuff would be done outside of, of class and lab. Um, and so from there, we went to a pre-lab and post-lab situation um, with the goals of making sure we were getting feedback as quickly as we could to the students um, so that we could get them on the same page before lab and then make sure they could really apply that information after lab. Mm -hmm. um, and, and also that they were getting information to us um, so part of what we wanted to do is to make sure with things like pre-labs wanted to make sure that um, we knew where they were at before we got into the lab and started going down a path that they didn't even know where we were at they mm -hmm. didn't know the starting point uh, and it gave us some we'll talk more about that but mm -hmm. it gave us some flexibility to understand where the students were at both before the lab as well as after the lab yeah, definitely. Um, so we really were trying to address that prerequisite problem. And some of it was that they knew the material, but they weren't comfortable enough to say they knew the material. Or maybe they'd learned the material, but in enough of a different way that they weren't connecting. So the pre-labs are set up, and we'll show you a couple of examples, but just to get them prepared for lab. So filling in gaps uh, that maybe one prereq covered better than the other prereq. Um, making sure they've gotten the basic concepts, just answering a few questions. And then uh, we've incorporated some videos. So watch how this food is made. Tell me what the basic steps are so that they are not fish out of water when they get into the lab and they don't know how to cut fat into the biscuits. Or um, I want to show you how the industrial hot dogs are made so you have a clue of what you're looking for for a meat batter when you're making it in lab. Um, and that's been very successful uh, <laughs> because they get to put it in their own words and think through the steps before they get to lab so they have an idea of what they're looking for. Um, and then the third one that was very important for us was calculations, um, working stepwise through calculations to make sure that you've done each step uh, because we do some somewhat complex calculations when it comes to protein quality, uh, fiber content um, that we think through logically to get to the answer, but it takes four or five steps. Um, and if they are screwed up on step one, um, then it takes a while to try to get everybody where they're supposed to go. So yeah, all the pre-labs are set up with questions expert answers, questions, expert answers, 
and then how long did it take you and what further questions do you have? And, and I'll say, you know, something like calculations, um, it's, it's one of the things where you're doing that and you've done it for years and, and you can go through it pretty quick on your own and you think, oh, well, why didn't they get this? Um, and then you start going through and breaking it down. And it turns out this thing that would take you a minute or two to do is 15 steps. And if they get lost on any one of those steps, when you just give them the problem, then they're lost at the end. And so trying to get them to think about, okay, which step is next in this process, you know, this logical thinking um, turned out to be uh, illuminating to me uh, mm -hmm. because you, know, you start breaking down the problems yeah. and it turns yeah. out that they are pretty complex yeah. and they do take a, a high degree of, of thinking. And uh, to see the students kind of see that and start thinking about how they can work through problems has been great. And I, I think I had, I had said that to Holly too, but thinking through the different phases and Kajal kept telling me I needed more phases and they kept saying, no, no, I don't, I don't think I need that many. Um, but the thinking through how you teach it and that systematic style shows gaps and maybe things that you jumped, but students can't yeah. jump. And that's, I think, what we saw. Yeah, I think we take for granted. Yeah. yeah, identifying gaps in our own, in our own teaching that, that mm -hmm. we didn't even yeah. know existed. Yeah. Rather than just, you know. Um, yep. Realizing where gaps in their knowledge is and then gaps in explanations and trying to tie those together because sometimes you've hit it but not as hard or you thought they had a piece before that would have been tied in to make that make more sense. But if you realize there's a gap, then your explanation didn't make any sense to them because it wasn't tied. Yeah. yeah. Um, so the, the pre labs are just, uh, they get points for completing before lab starts. Uh, we set it so it's due an hour before lab starts. So as we're running around, making sure we have everything, we also pull up the report um, and can flip through pretty darn quickly. Um, their answer is not word for word, but kind of do a, a quick skim on there. They got that, they got that, they got that. Ooh, they did not get that. Um, so that we have a little more time before lab starts to go through. Um, and for the most part, I think they've done a really good job of getting things. It just comes down to some of the protein calculations. Um, I, I think we thought they got it. We looked back through the numbers and went, oh, time out. <laughs> like, yeah. We're, we're going to need another example here, a bit more explanation. Um, and then the how long did it take and what questions do you still have um, are our last page. So we can skim through those pretty, pretty quickly. Um, generally, there aren't too many questions. But if there's something that they're really confused about, they are pretty good at putting that in there so that we can address some of those questions during the discussion. We'd like to use something like the muddiest point. Uh, and, and put that in there and, and really make that explicit to say, all right, what, what didn't you get? What was just so off? You didn't even know where to start with. Um, and I think we get some of that feedback as it is, um, but I think we can be a little bit more explicit. And yeah, definitely. Um, we can expand that a little bit too, but um, dietetic students on average think through problems very differently. Their expectations for things are very different than our food science and culinary food science students. Um, and so they actually have been very good at explaining, um, you know, we did significant figures and to us knowing through significant figures based on measurements is clear sense. They said, well, in our uh, medical charting, medical charting, you never put extra zeros because it could be considered a comma where that period is. And so we are taught to put as few of things behind the decimal or not include a decimal as possible. Well, crap, we had no idea that that was how they were yeah. getting drilled in another class. But by them telling us that, we went, okay, all right, we need a different way to explain things. Um, and there's well, a reason. Is, um, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and, and they've told us a few other things in terms of we're thinking through what's happening in the body, but we can't, you know, we don't always tie those things to what's happening in the food. And they'll tell us a couple different ways that your question you asked about functionality and we immediately went to a different piece. And so um, they have been really good, um, I think through ThinkSpace especially, but um, we set some extra time out to say, all right, what's working and what's not with ThinkSpace and how can we make this better? Um, and that was when they pointed out that some of the significant figure things was around midterm. Um, so it had some practice to it, um, things that made sense to them or did not make sense to them and where we're tying things together. So that's been really valuable for us as well. And kind of why we're probably in the infant stage, like we're going to get there, but just had to get a first start out there um, in terms of some of the, the problems and the way we think through things. So yeah, it's, it's more data, but a lot yeah. better. Yeah. And I think that's a good word scaffolding because I think that's where we're at right now. We are, it, it, we learned about this in the summer mm -hmm. and we started piecing it together 
um, as we want to implement it right away. Um, and, and we did, and there's, there's hiccups, you know, there's definitely some things and there's things that we, we want it to do now, but we don't have the time to make that happen just yet. Uh, but the great thing about Think Space is we can add to it. You know, we can, right. we can start putting embed more videos, embed some pictures, change yeah. the way we present the data. Um, but it grows. It's, it's, mm -hmm. We can put some, some flesh on the bones as, as the years go by. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, we'll show you examples. So then the post lab uh, is kind of what our, our lab reports uh, used to look like, but then with some more applications. Um, we're very purposeful in lab to have as much discussion as possible try to make everybody sure everybody's on the same page. We have some more clues about that, where they're coming in with their pre-lab. Um, they do lab reports in enough other classes that doing the formal lab report didn't carry as much value as really pushing on the critical thinking and applying this information. Um, so sometimes, I mean, they still do some statistics tables because we're supposed to cover statistics and we're doing some measurements in lab. Um, so they still do that. That would be kind of typical of your lab reports. Um, they answer a few of those questions, but then we really are trying to pull them further um, so, okay, now that you know what these different gluten-free flours do in muffins, um, look at mixes and tell us which one you would recommend to a client um, and give some more feedback that way. Or um, now that you know what a beet batter is doing and the, the meat ingredients um, are functioning, uh, which ham would you recommend? So trying to pull them a little bit further than where they're at now. Um, yeah. Yeah, the, the, and that's a, a decision Kate and I had made at, really at the end of last semester. Mm -hmm. And we said, okay, we, we need to get focus more we we want to do all this mm -hmm. what do we need to do for this course um, that they're not seeing in other courses and and critical thinking um, particularly to problems that they're going to see um, in their professional lives um, both of us came from from industry we know we have a lot of these scenarios so we were we were able to um, kind of hone in on that and think space as a tool helped us to to I guess amplify that uh, to a greater extent than what we were doing before, but we also made some changes with our course structure uh, that allowed us to focus more in on, on critical thinking. You know, you're, you need to do a non-GMO sustainable um, fat, yeah. uh, but you also need this functionality in your product. Here, here's what you have. How do you, how do you solve that sort of a problem? Yeah, and I see one of those just sort of office. You know, when we we do implement constraints and a lot of things like uh, your client likes this, your your intern says this. You know, something where you have some constraints maybe built into it. But one of the great things about Think Space and these sort of thinking problems is they come up with things honestly not what I was thinking of, mm -hmm. but it's right. Uh, it it makes sense. Mm -hmm. It's a good idea. And I would not have thought of that. Um, yeah, especially with, and, I, and I, I say the difference is just because they are so starkly different. But um, some of the dietetics uh, upper level courses are really about memorizing a lot of material, especially on the medical, some of those classes and things. And so when they get into a class that is critical thinking and there maybe isn't one right answer, um, you know, so we haven't had to think like this in any other class. I mean, just flat out, we have not had to think about this. The, the food science students maybe haven't as much um, either, but it's not such a stark contrast. Um, our food science students are just kind of go with the flow and happy about food and here we go, sort of. You know, it's just a different way of thinking through and, and some different feedback. But, you know, we had one of the dietetic students say, we have not had to think like this in any other class. Um, and, and that kind of realization that there isn't one answer it's did you think through the problem and come up with a solution that'll work um that uh yeah it kind of yeah. kind of blows their mind yeah we so we actually had opened up some time um uh, in one of our classes to we were going over the midterm and, and going over you know the, the answers and what we saw and that kind of thing and we also wanted to have some time to talk about what's working what's not working especially as we implement new technologies making sure that everybody's like okay this is good, we understand it, or, you know, this is really bad, this is, you know, you always find out things like, oh, um, turns out having things to do at 8 o'clock on a Thursday is actually really difficult for them. If we can make it till noon, it makes things a lot easier. Um, but in doing so, we got into this idea of critical thinking, especially with one of our sections is almost, actually, it's entirely dietetics students, and we're talking about this critical thinking idea, and they said, 
what Kate had, had addressed, that they hadn't really had to do this. And my thought would be then, and we don't want to do it. It probably was what I was thinking that they were going to say, but that wasn't what they no, said. What they no. said is, can you have more of this? <laughs> they actually want, they actually wanted more of, more of the critical thinking problems on, on think space uh, beyond what we had already put on there. Okay. I, I was like tearing up because I was like, oh, I'm so happy that you like, and it was just, I, I think it was me in, in application and real world problems and understanding, you know, you're coming out of here with a body of knowledge and some tools and some foundations, but... You you just, like, crashed so many stereotypes of a student. Yeah. Like, <laughs> one, more critical thinking students don't want to work hard. No, you just make their, your subject relevant for them. Yeah. And that's what they want. I, and they're also attainable. You don't have enough that, that it isn't frustrating that way. And I think I, I'm hearing another theme going through here. It's safe for me to not have the answer. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, I can give you yeah. feedback about what's not working for me, and I can also come out with something that isn't, you know, sort of the pat answer, but might be something that comes in from the side that yeah. would, might be a, mm -hmm. a valid alternative. Yeah, thinking yeah. outside the box. We we talk about how we value it. Let's let's value. It. One of the things we don't want to do is leave them frustrated. Right, and and you do run the risk of these kind of questions, getting them to where they're, uh, <laughs> this is too hard. We're never going to figure it out. Mm -hmm. With ThinkSpace, is because it allows us to present these more in a safe way, and to structure how they can start thinking about the problem. Um, by the time we get to it, the exams, which are going to be critical thinking, usually like we have five questions that are just really critical thinking questions they don't feel so lost, you know, they don't feel like it was unfair or that they didn't have the tools or they weren't prepared in a way. Um, even if they don't get the right, you know, even if they start going down the wrong path and, and it's, you know, and I, I try to grade like I'm your boss, you know, this is um, an okay answer, but this is what would be make it better kind of a thing uh, when we do the exams. Um, but we didn't get, I think this year we didn't get many people being frustrated about it. It was like, oh, yeah, yeah, okay. Um, and I can see why I got points here, and I can see why maybe I didn't get full points. Uh, but they, they're starting to get into that. And I think if we can introduce it, you know, right now we're doing it for one class. And Kate and I, what we want to do is, and then Ted, I hope you're listening to this. <laughs> uh, we want our curriculum. Um, especially at these upper level yeah. courses, and this is the 400 level class, we want our students coming out of a lot of other courses knowing how to utilize these critical thinking skills and putting things together integration is the other big thing that we're interested in uh so this one is uh in the lab they do um bread with different amounts of gluten in it so they're getting a concept of what that structure is and then uh gluten-free muffins with a variety of different uh flour replacements and then are evaluating. So on the one hand, you're trying to maximize gluten and really understand what's happening with that structure. And then on the other hand, let's pull that out completely and how do you try to rebuild that. Um, the dietetic students and culinary food science students have had a lot of interaction with bakery products and what's happening with the gluten. The food chemistry students have pretty much none. They understand protein chemistry, but not really what's happening with the flour. So trying to get them somewhat to a similar spot. So this is a video about uh, gluten function. And then they have to say, uh, what the functions are, uh, what ingredients inhibit that gluten formation, um, and then how does the type of flour relate to gluten formation. So a good portion of that they can get from the video and then also from the lecture slides. So we do lecture Monday morning at 8 a.m., um, which is never our favorite time, but it's the only time it fits in the schedule. Uh, then this opens right after and is open until lab starts. We have two sections on Thursday and one on Friday. Um, so this is the, the kind of digesting material after lecture. Uh, and then it's followed with, so here it carries forward just so they can see their answer and then really what the expert answer is. And we try to emphasize that they don't have to get everything in that expert answer, but that's where they should be headed. Yeah. You know, trying to think through. And we re really like this part because here I can just unload an expert answer and, and I can talk about mm -hmm. uh, this particular problem and maybe some things where uh, we didn't necessarily address, but they're 
they correspond to it, tangential to it, um, and they get it right away. I mean, this is in a nice table format where they can actually go through and say, oh, yeah, yeah, or, oh, I didn't see that. Let me go back through my notes and see where maybe I, mm-hmm. I missed something. Um, and that's been helpful. Yep. And then the, and, and sometimes we just have a couple. It kind of depends on how many topics we need to cover. But in this case, uh, the next thing we want to know or have them know, all right, now you know what gluten is. You know what's going to slow it down or cause problems with it. So now let's focus on the instructions and the way that the lab is set up so you know what you are looking for when you get there. Um, And so we do a sponge and dough system, which is slightly different uh, than what they've done in other labs, or if they haven't done it at all, they may be unfamiliar, but you get to talk about industrial reasons why, and then also how it fits in our lab lab time, basically. So they um, are uh, figuring out what the sponge and dough is uh, based on the instructions. Um, there is another way or a specific way. It's called the window pane test to so figure out if your gluten is fully developed. So they had to read through instructions on how to test and put it in their own words. So they had an idea to make sure that their gluten was fully formed in the bread that they were making um, and what that was supposed to look like to try to get everybody to about the same point in terms of mixing uh, and, and, and a step basically that they knew what they were looking for while they were making the bread. Um, and then uh, this is their hypothesis area so they knew which different flowers were going to be tested and they were hopefully saying something about um, how that would relate to the bread volume so they put some thought in before they get there Um, and then again another set of expert answers and then um, what questions do you have and about how long did you take I clearly put in a lot of effort there at my one minute mark (laughs) Um, and that helps us the how long did it take helps us to understand if, if they're having to spend a lot of time with this, then we're missing something in the lecture. Um, if, if they're spending more time trying to figure that out than they, than they spent getting the information, then it's probably too, too long for a pre-lab. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And that helps us to gauge how much time they're spending. It's, it's too credit class. We had to be conscious of that. Yeah. Um, and they, they are uh, very good at telling us, um, 15 minutes, uh, including watching the video, or 30 minutes, I was also watching TV. I mean, yeah, yeah. <laughs> they're honest. They are so honest. <laughs> Candid answers we get are very, yeah. very clear. Yeah. Um, so then after they, so, so yeah, we're, we're trying to be under an hour um, for pre 30 minutes. Yeah. Um, if, if we can get to 30 minutes, it's great. Um, Cause that tells me that they feel comfortable going into it. Um, they felt like these questions were things that they were aware of. They, mm-hmm. and, you know, and presumably they've already gone through their notes. They, they've already done some some background stuff. Uh, maybe they have, maybe they haven't. Maybe this just yeah. forces them to go through their background stuff. But either way, mm-hmm. um, 30 minutes to an hour. Yeah, uh, really, it's an hour, hopefully, in between their lecture and their lab so that they've gone back through their notes. They've printed off the lab instructions. Uh, they work for their pre-lab, and then they've started their lab notebook. Yeah. And hopefully half about half of that is think space and the the good news is in many of these cases um it was 15 or 20 minutes yeah. so we probably have another 10 minutes with a play which is great for a few extra videos a few extra questions that we're realizing we thought they had that but they didn't to be able to put a few more things back in there um some some have taken a little bit longer but yeah. we're trying to track that as we go um so then this would be the post lab that is tied to the gluten um so since the pre-lab focused more on what gluten function is and then they make the muffins that don't have gluten in them um, with a, a variety of different flours. Uh, then this is looking at gluten-free products. And so this is tailored slightly more towards uh, dietetic students on this first one. And then the second one's a little bit more for food science, but really it's the same concepts, same principles. Uh, so there are three mixes. Uh, you have the nutrition facts and uh, what's in the ingredient mix plus what gets added. Um, and I've just done these in PowerPoint slides because it's my easiest way of formatting and then putting the pictures up into ThinkSpace. Um, there might be better ways to do it, but it uh, goes pretty quickly this so way. So you've done screenshots? Uh, no, but I just saved the PowerPoint slides as, as a picture. Uh, yeah, as a picture. I don't remember if it's yeah. PNG or, um, but anyway, um, and then upload it in my resources and then link it into the material. So then there are questions, uh, which mix would you recommend to someone following a gluten-free diet? <laughs> Uh, why would you make this recommendation and make sure to include two reasons and then what additional information would you like um, to know about this recommendation which 
um, maybe mixing instructions, maybe cost, maybe um, if the the person you're recommending has any other allergies or any other concerns, that sort of thing. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and then the second one, and then this one is a scenario where you've been asked to formulate a gluten-free chocolate chip cookie for a bakery, um, and you want a starting point. So you looked up some recipes, and so there are a couple of recipes with the instructions. And same sort of questions, which one would you start with and why? Um, and then what else would you want to know about that scale up or where you're making the cookie basically to, to decide? So basically they've done a lab, you, you did a pre-lab, then they went and did something in the mm -hmm. lab. Mm -hmm. And now you are kind of extrapolating on mm -hmm. it. Yes. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Now that yeah. they should have, they've, you know, they've been introduced to the theory. They've gone through some of the practice with, you know, training wheels. Mm -hmm. um, and now we're asking to now make that next step yeah. forward yeah. and start thinking how you could apply what you just learned to, to this. Yep. Um, and then it's the same carry forward with the uh, ode to cookie, but a little less, I don't know, fancy or jazzy, I suppose. Um, but all their answers pull forward uh, here. We could really use your help because we don't always get them to show up where we want them to. Yeah, we get a space off. So, yeah. Somewhere there's a space in there, which is... This is our coding limitation right here. Yeah. We get mad at this. Yeah. <laughs> and I know there's just one more divide thing in there we need to take out. But yeah. anyway, um, then they have to copy and paste this out. Uh, and we try to encourage them edit. So please reread through your answers, make sure they're complete, um, and then put it back in as a PDF. Sometimes they have to add a stats table to this part. So I, it, it works, and I, I'm hoping that they're being a little more purposeful once they have to pull it out and put it back in, but whether they are or aren't, you can kind of tell based on having extra spaces in, in our formatting, you know if anybody took the time to take the space out. <laughs> and so you can kind of tell who's editing, who's not editing yeah. at all. Cause you're like, dude, you didn't even, you didn't yeah. even change our web formatting yeah. to put it back. But it's okay. I think we're, we're seeing some progress as we've gone through too, um, as we've gone. So uh, we like, um, um, we're building our library comments as we go. So I don't know that we've gotten all of our efficiency there, but we, I really like clicking the numbers and being able to pull comments oh, yeah. over in the PDF when it opens up. Compared to Blackboard, so much easier to grade. Yeah. Uh, it's Did just, the yeah, we're, yep. we're building. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Building. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it's, it's nice. We build it. Usually you build it pretty quick mm -hmm. uh, because you start seeing some things that are being. So we don't take any late work. Um, so as soon as the post lab is due, then the expert answer comes up. So even if it takes us a while to get to the grading part, which goes faster now than it did when we were in Blackboard, um, they can immediately check. Um, so then the, the last phase is locked until our due date, and then so it opens up afterwards. Report. Yeah. Yeah. So they have uploaded, and so you are giving feedback, but they still get yeah. Yeah. Yep. yeah. And, and as we get through and as we see some of these answers that we'd like to share with the class, we, we do that. Mm -hmm. um, so, but what happens if like you've submitted and I'm, I'm doing it later, but you see the actual So it, it, it uh, doesn't open based on when you've submitted, it opens based on when the deadline is. Oh. So if it's due at 11.59 tonight, then it'll open at 1 a.m. Okay. Or, yeah, know, just that way everybody's after. on the same because we yeah. have staggered lab sections. Yeah. Cool. So um, it's taking some pressure off. Again, I mean, we want to grade and get comments back to them as quickly as we can, but it takes us a while. It's probably always going to be our Achilles heel, especially because we're spending time building pre-labs and post-labs here as we go. Um, but it's not like they have to sit and wait for what the right answer was because they can get it right after it's due. Yeah, and because this part is really about assessment. We want them to be able to assess themselves. Where are they at? Are they able to come up with pretty close to the answers that an expert would come up with? You know, we don't expect them to come up with exactly the right answer because they're not experts exactly. They're mm -hmm. foundational tools. Um, and so it's for them, but then it's also for us uh, mm -hmm. to go back through and figure out if, yeah. if they're getting it or they're not. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and by doing so they're, we think, and I think we'll net out, especially in the final to see how they're pre preparing for exams and, um, and challenge so projects. Do you, see, do you see in subsequent lab, do you see mistakes repeating or self-correcting? Uh, uh, a lot of self-correction, like stats tables, we, mm -hmm. we've had some things where they have to upload a table and they get, um, you know, a lot of that's kind of like modeling stats. So when they come out with at the end, 
we try to tell them, okay, here's what we're looking for up front uh, so they understand, but it takes a while for them to get it into their heads uh, that this is what we're looking for. Uh, the more they see it, uh, the better they do on things like tables. They, they don't put 12 significant figures at the end. They remember to put a p-value. Uh, they remember how to put their captions in and their titles and units for their you know, uh, uh, measurements and things like that. So uh, in that way, they're getting better uh, just by modeling. Uh, but I think we're seeing improvement in terms of how they're thinking through problems. Um, I think uh, when we first introduced the first real critical thinking problem, um, yeah, I think it was a struggle, mm -hmm. uh, yeah. especially for those who hadn't done it before. And now as they understand us and what we're looking for, they understand that there's not a right answer. Mm -hmm. And even that we're still struggling yeah. with trying to get, get that not a right answer. Exactly. There's a better answer. There's a, an answer that probably wouldn't take you very far. Mm -hmm. Um, but there's not a necessarily a right answer. They're getting better about mm -hmm. free, free expression, I think. Yeah, it's just not the case with real world problem solving. There's, yeah, the better, the okay, and the ooh, maybe we should rethink that one. Um, and so this helps us out along with, and I think it's gonna take us a while to figure out, are we making the, the progression to where we want it to be? We're probably not quite there, but I think we've made good strides yeah. in where we're, we're trying to go. I do think, and uh, you know, kudos to Kay because she was the one who made the initiative of of bringing this into food science, uh, and it's well suited for food science. Mm -hmm. um, well, the dietetic students have had a lot of and success too. Yeah. Yeah, the building, um, but just to get them, it, yeah. of course, if we could have some money, that would be great. <laughs> <laughs> Mainly to support Kay, I think, in the summer and yeah. stuff like that, where she could, you know, start looking at some of these other courses and start saying here's an example of what you can do uh, and make it real to them because I think that that's the thing once some of the professors who may be resistant to it can see how it's going to make their life easier because it is I mean it's a little it's some upfront work uh, for sure and this first year is going to be more probably more work than the subsequent years in terms of building um, but as far as the students getting it and not getting frustrated with them saying, oh, they're students, you know. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think we could really benefit as a whole in the mm -hmm. curriculum and, and just, yeah. We're, yeah, no, clearly. And I, you know, I was really glad that Joey saw the benefit too, but we were at a point that we could not keep doing it the same way because we were not getting the results. Working. Yeah, yeah, and so, you know, the time that it's taken to put it together um, is well worth the outcome because we're now you know, they're, they're still learning. I think there's still some room for improvement, but we've made huge strides in getting them where we need to be. And I think that most of them are getting to in terms of, we really want you to be able to go apply this information and this is where we're trying to get you. And I think they get that fairly well. Um, yeah, I think the students are buying in fast. Mm -hmm. I, I would like to see the professors start to buy in. Yeah. Um, they're going to be more influenced by numbers. So if you say it cuts your time in half, yeah. take it, mm -hmm. you know. Yeah, and that's right. And and I, you know, some of it uh, this year, I can't necessarily say that my time. Some things like the grading has has cut back the mm -hmm. amount of time we spend there, but we spend time up front developing stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, but that's an investment. Uh, we we see this as something that it, yeah, it's going to pay off in the long run. Yeah, um, and, and like it's not so much about the time for me as the degree of frustration of yeah. feeling that you make an impact in how you're teaching and how they're learning. Um, and, and that's really where I'm loving tech space. <laughs> yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, to work. And the other thing that I would say about expert answers is it forces us to think through really what we're looking for. Um, we can pull some of these things over word for word into our comment library to build. So it's that extra step and then there's some times where if they've completely missed a concept, you can say, not quite on the right track, check out expert, you know, expert phase or answer phase um, to kind of fill in. So you don't have to use as many words, I guess, with the, the grading because yeah, over and over and over. it's all there. And so you try to put in short things that they need or to, to kind of turn them. But, you know, if they mess up the statistics table completely because they just weren't reading instructions, you know, not the, not the correct format, check out answer phase. Um, so that helps too.
So do you know where students, so is there something after this where students have to incorporate your comments or something changes? So do you know, I mean, are they going in and reading it? We're not sure. Um, I think the dietetic students are, I'm not sure if the food science students are, <laughs> would be my guess. Yeah, I mean, um, they, you know, come to the page, how much they read, we're not sure. Um, I have but, an idea for you. Okay, <laughs> okay great. <laughs> okay, because to some extent, they're going to draw on this knowledge in their exams. Um, and yeah. and we, our exams are open everything. So have at it. Uh, Besides open friend, but yeah, open friend. Yeah, yeah, open everything else. I think that's something we need to put in a little bit more because ours are very high stakes because it comes down to midterms and, and final exams, which as part of the grade isn't, you know, yeah. it's what 20% of the grade in total. Um, but we do, har like in the expert answers, we'll harp on things like we're talking about protein, we're going to harp on denaturation and ask like point or something like that. And in the exam, we're going to have a question that they better know what denaturation is and isoelectric points and how that affects functionality of, of proteins and foods. Um, but it's almost so high stakes because it, now it's at a, a an exam standpoint. Um, I'm thinking, as you say that, you know, it'd probably be good to bring them yeah. into class a little bit more and, and do some more of that. Yeah, I think we'll build and have some more practice and things in as we go. I do think they read the expert answers for the pre-lab very well because they have to progress through and then there's questions after the last expert answer there in terms of how long it took and what other questions you have. I'm just not sure how many of them, and we went through it once, but maybe need to do a little bit more, are finding all their comments once we get um, the post-labs graded and then going to that last phase to figure out answers. They'll, they'll probably go back through and do it before the final. No, I mean, that's yeah, probably that's their... realistically you know where they're going to focus on it. There. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. We've shown them all that. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, we're, we're not positive on the post lab answer, how many of them are going there. But Yeah, we'll have probably better data on that after our final exam uh, because we've started incorporating more of the critical thinking towards this back half of the, yeah. it, it was towards the begin the latter half of the first, because we had to go through so much other stuff that's not critical that's thinking right. exactly yeah. in the first four or five weeks. And yeah. then we move into the critical thinking. I think we'll have a better idea about that and how it's working out after the final exam, mm -hmm. uh, but it would be nice, I think, to incorporate that a little bit earlier. Yeah, um, I think we have just a couple slides, but I think we maybe have touched on them, um, what we've done. So, yeah, we, uh, oh, sorry. No, that's okay. Um, when we were setting up our first set of things and adding students in, um, Kajal asked me if I wanted separate sections for the different labs. Um, and I think at that point in time, I said, well, oh, no, I just want to do it once. Like, let's just set this up as one. Uh, we probably will go to multiple sections just because uh, of when due dates are and trying to get um, each of the different sections incorporated, especially with um, some of their other classes and um, feasibility and just trying to make that easier for them. Yeah, we'll have to think about that. Yeah, maybe. Well, we haven't decided. <laughs> maybe. Um, yeah, I think... You know, the, a few of the students were asking for more critical thinking questions, and it occurred to me, and I'm not exactly sure that's true, but part of the way that they phrased it um, was that they did not realize how much critical thinking they were doing in some of the lab, or, you know, the think space yeah. work that they were doing. And so, one, that was great, because we are getting to work through complex systems and, and getting them where we want them to be, but then, two, how do you sort of point that out, that you did think through a system, we just broke it down into small enough pieces that you got it, and now, Without the training critical wheels, critical thinking has to yeah. be hard and yeah. terrible. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. yeah. yeah. Um, to, to kind of keep those skills as they develop through think space, but take the training wheels off and you know let them go. And I think we'll know with the, the final project and the um, final exam as well if we've gotten there. But it's one of those weird things about how much help and how many steps do you give them, and then how much do you go, okay, go, and and shove them out the door, um, sort of thing. But yeah, that's really our struggle is that they're pretty much all seniors and headed out. And so it's yeah. not in terms of material covered. It's not like you can say, well, we didn't quite get where we needed to be. Good luck next class. There is not a next class for yeah. those concepts. And so trying to get them ready. No, I think if, if we can figure out how to get it incorporated in some of the other classes, so the, the concept of thinking through complex problems and real world problems is not so novel when they get to 411 or that they've seen it other places, then we're steps forward in terms of how far we can yeah, go. Yeah, because they're starting to master that idea of critical thinking, yeah, yeah. and it's carried over between mm -hmm. 
Um, and, and there are some, like I, I teach a, a quality assurance class that is, uh, we're going to use this. Uh, we're going to be using things page for it. Um, it's heavy on statistics and things like that. Um, but we, same thing, there's scenarios or problems that they need to think through. And um, hopefully we start to carry through some of those critical thinking mm -hmm. skills. Uh, but in that class, we have more time to go over this kind of stuff. We can, you know, give a couple of scenarios, give some expert answers, and then go through a, a you know, more like a quiz type of a thing where yeah. Yeah. now there, there's a little bit more mm -hmm. riding on it. Yeah. Well, you know, thinking of a whole curricular thing as you're talking about, I always wanted to, I always wanted to do this at the vet school, you know, and then start off maybe as a freshman, you get a puppy, and it has all these oh, things. Yeah, throw it up. Yeah. Uh, yeah, curriculum, and you see its family, and you get to know it. Yeah. And then you get the elderly dog things at the end. You know, <laughs> and, and, and actually, we're working with a, a faculty member at University of Arizona that really, really liked that idea. Uh, I like that idea too. School. So I think we may get to that point. But I'm wondering if you could take systems. Do you know that? I think we could. I think we say, okay, so you made this in your dorm room. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, yeah, and yeah. and then uh, you start going up. Now you're getting to scale up, and mm -hmm. you're working through R and D. And now you got to get through processing, and I think that would be cool. Yeah. Where are you going to get the commercialization? Yeah, yeah. 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 No, I think there's you know, so product development has a lot of that creative um, thinking in teams. So I think there's some different ways we can use think space there, um, kind of some of that idea generation, but also uh, keeping track of the, the ideas and the system in place, working through phases and stuff. So I think there's ways we can do it that the the processing in terms of problem solving and how to put equipment together and what your bottlenecks are going to be and all that stuff probably fits too. So I think there's a lot of ways, the more we use it, I think the less burden on us in terms of introducing critical thinking and doing some of that stuff. Um, which, you know, you feel like they've had it a little bit in some places, but maybe not purposefully. Um, in all the places that they've gone through. Yeah, yeah, exactly. 